So John 14, 1 to 10. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way into the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. This is the word of the Lord. I'm not going to preach through all of those <laughs> verses. I just wanted to give some context. Today I'm just going to be concentrating on uh, John 14, verse 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, you've probably heard the, um, the old proverb that says, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish and he'll eat every day for the rest of his life. Um, that's not true. I've taught plenty of people to fish and they've caught nothing. All right? Um, you know, I, I've got... I've got, I'm a, I'm a pretty keen fisherman, as some of you would know, and my wife actually counted how many fishing rods I've got, and do you know how many there were? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> it's embarrassing. But, uh, you know, you need a different rod for every different style of fish, and ev I mean every different species of fish, and every different style of fishing. There's rock fishing, and beach fishing, and lure fishing, and bait fishing, game fishing, and boat fishing, and trolling, and jigging, and... You know, and I've, I've embedded a few more just so I can buy more rods. Coarse fishing. Sorry? And coarse fishing. Coarse fishing, that's right. You heard about coarse fishing. That's a whole other thing. And, and there's so many different ways you can fish. But even if I gave you the best of my rods and gave you a map to where to catch the fish and gave you the right equipment and everything like that, chances are, and I could teach you how to fish, you would catch nothing. Because it turns out that what you really need is you need me to go with you. It's, uh, you know, there's a world of difference between being told how to fish by an expert angler and fishing with an expert angler. So it turns out I am the way to the fish, all right? If you want to catch fish, then it doesn't matter what you know, it matters who you're with. And if you're with me, you will catch fish. It's really that simple. I mean, I know it sounds like bragging, but I'm really good at it. What can I tell you? And if you're with me, you're going to catch fish. And uh, people think fishing is a matter of luck. It is not. It is, uh, it's really a whole different thing. Now, um, now, fishing is one thing, but catching is entirely another. And something like this is true of what Jesus is saying here when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What he is saying and what he's not saying is really important. What he's saying here is that Jesus himself is the way. It's, it's in him or with him that you go on the way. He doesn't just give you a map of the way. He doesn't just point you along the way and explain how to get there. I mean, in this, in this uh, reading we had read to us from John 14, um, Jesus was explaining to the disciples, this is his final discourse before the crucifixion, and he's explaining that he's going to prepare a place for them. And the place he's preparing is a place in the family of God. He said, I'm going to make a place for you and uh, the way he was going to make that way, of course, was his death on the cross and the resurrection. He overcame sin and death, opened up the way for us that we could join him in the Father's home, in the Father's house. That's a whole thing which we won't look at right now. But then he said to them, and you know the way to where I'm going. And to this, Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And it seems like Thomas was actually asking for directions. He was saying, well, you know, give us some waypoints, give us, a, give us a map and show us how to get there. That'd be great. 
But Jesus replied saying um, that he himself is the way and the truth and the life and that no one comes to God the Father except through me. And when he says through me, he's not just saying, I'm going to give you a map, I'm going to give you directions, and then you'll make your own way there. No, in other words, what Jesus is saying is that I myself am the way, and it's only in me that you get there. Just if you want to catch fish, you've got to be with me. If you want to get to God the Father, you've got to be with Jesus, or in Jesus even more, because he is the only way to the Father. He doesn't just show us the way, he is the way. And that is what Jesus meant when he said, I am the way. Um, you know, many people say things like Jesus, you know, I think of Jesus as a great moral teacher. Or they might say he is a wise man and he supplies us with sage advice on how to live a better life. Or some people say, you know, Jesus is the perfect example. Now, all of those things are true and they're good. But that's not what Jesus meant when he said, I am the way. He's not just the teacher of the way. He's not just... He's not just the one who gives us wisdom, and he's not just the one who gives us an example of how to get there. Rather, Jesus is much more than a teacher or a prophet or an example to follow. He does more than give us knowledge about God, for in him we actually come to know God. What a, what a thing to say. What an arrogant, it almost sounds arrogant. If someone said, I know God. But, you know, I can't know God. I can't really know him. I can know about him through a prophet or a teacher or a preacher. I can know about God. But to say you know God, what a thing to say. How can anyone actually know God? Well, you can know God in Jesus. If you're in Christ, you share in his knowing of God. And that's, that's an extraordinary, and it's a mind-blowing and profound and yet very simple at the same time. Uh, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, Jesus said, No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Now what's, what's he saying there? What he's saying is, there's a uniqueness in the knowledge that the Father has of the Son and the Son has of the Father. It's like it's a, it's a, a conversation and friendship and connection which only they can know in the way that they know it. Have you ever gone to a party and there's two people who are engaged in a really full-on intimate conversation and they're face-to-face -face and, and you can see that they're, they're responding to each other. There's a reciprocal kind of relationship going on. You'd love to be part of the conversation, but you can't get in. And unless one of them opens that circle of conversation up, you can't get in. I mean, you can try to force your way in. But to be part of the conversation, you have to be let in. And what Jesus is saying is the conversation and the friendship and the joy and the relationship that I have with the Father is unique to me. No one else knows what I know. People know about it, but they don't know it because I'm the only one who's in it. Only the Father knows the Father. Only the Son knows the Father as the Father. And only the, 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 the Father knows the Son as the Son. You know, like my children know me as father, but no one here can know me that way. You can know me as David, or as that minister at that church where they have long sermons, or whatever. But to know me as father is unique to my children. And Jesus is saying, I have a unique connection to God. And I see him in a way that no one else sees him. In fact, I don't just see him as the almighty God. I see him as father. When, when, uh, when our kids were little, we used to have a little game, and um, some of you would be familiar with this game, but if, two, if, if, if in conversation two people said the same word at exactly the same time, then one of you could say, jinx, and that would mean that the other person wasn't allowed to talk until someone let them off by saying their name. Does anyone know this game? Am I the only one? Okay, a few people know it, yeah. All right, so say we're in family conversation, and this used to happen, um, one time, one of my sons jinxed me because I said the same word as him at the same time, and he went, jinx! And then that meant I wasn't allowed to talk until one of them said my name. And then one of my other sons, he said, uh, David. And, and then he said, so now he's off jinx. But then my, the son who'd put me on jinx said, no, everyone else calls him David, but we call him Dad. It's different. 
So for them, my name isn't David. My name is Dad. And for Jesus, God isn't God Almighty. He's Father. It's different. Because Jesus has a relationship with God that no one else does. It's a unique relationship which only he has. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. But then he says, to, and to anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him, and the will of the Son is that he wants to take what he knows of the Father and spread it out to us, and for us to come to know what he knows. That's really what he's saying when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, I mean, it sounds very exclusive when Jesus says, I am the only way, the one and only unique way to the Father. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that means he's excluding all other philosophies, religions, political ideology, wisdoms, whatever. And that sounds so, what a, what a, that sounds so exclusive. But it, oddly enough, in this ironic kind of way, it's inclusive in that it is it's maybe the only way, but he wants, he's offering it to everyone. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say that no one else has good ideas about God. You can come to know true things about God. True things about God is one thing, but to know God truly is another thing. So, um, and again, we have to say that, so he goes on to say, so he says, I'm the way, but he also says, I am the truth. And again, we have to say, Jesus is not merely saying that he gives us all the facts about God. By truth, he means the inner reality and the truth about who God really is. You know, a preacher or a prophet can only point you towards God or tell you things that are true about God, but Jesus comes and shows you who God actually is and shares that with you. You know, anyone can know certain true things about God by mere observation of the creation, but to know God as Father is another thing. You know, if you observe the creation around you, you can come up with true things about God. One of the first things even a three-year-old child would be able to tell you that God is creator. How do I know that? Well, look, there's stuff. You don't have to be a very clever philosopher to know that God is creator or that God is great. But to know God as Father, that can't be given to you by human thought. There was a great uh, early church theologian called Athanasius who put it this way, he said, it's more devout and more precise to know God as Father through Jesus the Son than to know God as Creator through the things he has made. Can you see that? So he's saying it's more, it's more accurate and it is more spot on to be able to know God as Father through Jesus the Son than through the wisest of philosophies that looks at and observes the creation. Observing the creation, you can come up with conclusions about God that are true, but it's a whole other thing to say that God is Father. Now, there's a famous old hymn that goes like this. We'll all know it. It says, uh, it goes, immortal, invisible, God only wise. You've got the tune in your head now. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. Enlightened, accessible, hid from our eyes. That's a great hymn. Beautiful tune. Everything in it's true. But it's depressing for me because it just tells you, it gives you a vision of what, they, what I'd call the deist God. That is the God of 200 years ago who lived above the clouds and who was in light, inaccessible and hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious and ancient of days. But he's invisible and immortal and he's just this great God who's unknowable, ineffable. And, and you know, there's kind of this truth in that, but, but there's a difference here is that that God who's unknowable to human flesh, that Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, who is God, who has dwelled with the Father forever, has come and earthed that knowledge in the, in the incarnation, and he's come and he's made God known in the man Jesus Christ. And now he's not invisible anymore, and he's not hid from our eyes. Now, Jesus has come and shown us who God really is. And in Christ, we get to see something which you could never otherwise know. And it's a great song, but yeah. And then Jesus goes on to wrap this, this part up saying, and I am also the life of the Father. And it's really important that the, the last part of that sentence, he's not just saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, but he's saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life of the Father, not just of some you know, immortal, invisible God. 
of you know, the omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient God. Now, all those things are true about God, but that's not... God did, Jesus didn't come to show us the omnipotence of God. He came to show us the fatherhood of God. Another thing. So when he said, I am the life, he's saying... Um, he's speaking here of something like life in a family. Um, you know, the life of a family mainly takes around, place around a kitchen table and it's, it's, uh, it's eating a meal together, it's participating in the banter of, in, the, in the conversation around the table, it's being caught up in the culture of the family and the friendship and the camaraderie. That's, that's what the life of a family is, isn't it? It isn't their bank balance or their house. It's the home. A home is different than a house. Anyone can make a house, but a home is where connections are taking place and where love is being reciprocated. And that's the kind of life that Jesus is talking about there. He's not just talking about a dose of biological life. He's talking about the Greek word here is zoe, the life of God, which is oftentimes described adjectivally as, the, as eternal life. Often eternally is put before the word life because the nature of that life is such that it's it's ongoing. And it's not just that eternal life isn't just living forever. In fact, Jesus described eternal life in John 17, verse 3, when he said, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, that's the Father, and Jesus Christ, who is the Son, whom you have sent. So Jesus says that eternal life isn't going to heaven and living forever. Eternal life is knowing God and being caught up in the relationship that Jesus has with the Father. Can you see that? So eternal life isn't something that you have independent of God. It's not like God's over here and you're over here enjoying eternal life and every now and then he does a parade down your street and you in the, in the, in the, heavenly, in the heaven and you throw ticker tape at him and say thank you. No, no, you're ongoingly participating in the conversation around the kitchen table. And so um, that's what it means to have the life of God. So eternal life is not so much about being up in heaven. It's about being caught up in the relationship between father and son, having a share in their face-to-face -face communion and their oneness. So I'm just going to show you a quick picture here, um, which, yeah. Now this, this is really interesting. This is a, off an old icon. And I didn't think about this before I... thought about using this as an illustration, thinking that there's going to be a lot of people who know a little bit about Greek in the church today. <laughs> but um, that's, that, that little symbol there that goes like that, all right? That's, a lot of the icons had that. That's actually a symbol of Christ in the Greek. You've got iota, which is what that, the sign language for iota. And then you've got the sigma. Now, that looks like a C, but... It's, that's the medieval formation of sigma. So there's, a, there's the bent finger. And then there's chi, which is what we would call an X, which is that symbol there. And then there is another sigma. And that's a shorthand version. If, if a preacher held that up, that was a symbol of Christ. But it, it has further significance because it also is a sign of the Trinity. It's saying there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the sun, you'll see, is bent round and he's touching the thumb. And that thumb represents humanity and that finger represents Jesus. And there is an overlap between the divine and the human in Jesus because Jesus is both human and divine at the same time. So the Venn diagram, if you like, if you've got God and then you've got humanity, it overlaps in the body of Jesus Christ. So it means that divinity and humanity only join in one place and that is in the body of Jesus and if we want to know God the only way we can know God is to be in where those two circles overlap you see that's that's the family thing happening right there <laughs> you see only they know what's going on you know but she could bring us in but anyway but can you see, see so that, that was, uh, and, and in the early church, they used to teach about the incarnation a lot. We don't talk about it so much these days, which is sad. But what Jesus went on to say in John 14, that same chapter, a little few verses later, in verse 20, he says, On that day, which is the day of Pentecost, if you read the 
the context. He says, on the day of Pentecost, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. That's what he's saying. He says, you see, I'm in the Father. I've got all this action going on up here with the God the Father, and I've known the Father from before creation. Eternally, Jesus has been the Word with God. He has been in relationship, conversation, joy, friendship, all that. And then he has come and he's joined himself to our humanity. So everything that's in Jesus is now being shared with humanity. And if we are in Christ, then everything that's in Christ is in us. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's a mystery, but it's, it's a reality. So if you are in Christ and Christ is in you, then everything that's in Christ, which is God the Father, is now in you and you get to enjoy fellowship with God. And you come to know God not just as God Almighty, creator, immortal, invisible, God only wise, you get to know God as Father. And you're not just a servant anymore, you get to become a child in the family. Imagine if that was true. Well, the good news is it is true for anyone who believes and puts their faith in Jesus Christ and says, you know what? I've tried making my own way in the world. I've tried to come to know God. I've tried to be good and failed. Or you might have been good and succeeded. It doesn't make any difference. The only thing that makes a difference, the only way, the exclusive way, is Jesus. If a doctor said to you, there's only one way that you can get healed if you take this medicine, and if you don't, you are definitely going to die, you're not going to say to the doctor, Oh, well, that's a bit exclusive. I don't, you're sort of saying no to all those other medicines. I don't think that's very fair. It doesn't matter whether it's fair or not. What matters is whether it's true. And the truth is that Jesus is the one and the only way to know God as Father. There is no other way. Prophets and preachers and philosophers can tell you true things about God and about creation, but what they cannot tell you is that God is Father. And even if they could tell you that, they can't bring you into it. In, if you trust in Christ, you, re, you, you change your mind, you put your allegiance with him, you are baptised and believe in Jesus Christ, you will come to know God. And not just God, but God the Father. Amen.